Oh, you look, you look very, you also look very dapper, John. How's it going, Kevin? Going well on the, on the recovery from uh, COVID. Feeling good, feeling better. <laughs> All right, good, good. How are you, Abram? Um, I'm doing well. Kind of exhilarated. I just finished working out literally 30 seconds ago. <laughs> but other than that, dealing with a, a cat that has a gash on her one of her legs and seeing if I have to take her to the vet. But all things considering, feeling good right now. You and your cat, I feel like there's all this stuff. I have three. Well, actually, oh, okay. I don't have I don't have any. Three cats have me. I'm their, I'm their pet, I'm their pet human. Okay. How you doing, Carlos? Doing well, like in the jacket. Thanks. Looking fresh. I'm, I like your uh, your beardless look. I have to say. Thank you. I was um I was Voldemort this weekend. So I had to shave my head and face. Yeah. Yeah, we went to the the Harry Potter exhibit, all dressed up as a group. To the that was Voldemort. Nice. Yeah. Just seeing, uh, John. Can you hear us? John, you there? Guys, I'm gonna call John just to make sure. Oh. Loving that hair, Shay. That is, guys, just all tell Shay how beautiful her hair looks. I'm going to call John real quick. Oh, that's awkward. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I'll be back in a minute. And then the intention of the next minute is just to let Shay know how beautiful her hair is. And then I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> hey. What did you do different? Did you do? I got attention. So they're like, they're not done up right now, so they look kind of janky, but yeah. They're like the really long ones. They look better curled. Otherwise, they don't blend so well, but yeah. Cool. Cool. Fun. So do you feel that you've been fully appreciated and acknowledged for your beautiful hair, Shay? That was yeah. our assignment. Yeah. <laughs> we all kind of got to It's like, please stop, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think we all sense your uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortableness with it. So, but all right, just try to make her as uncomfortable as possible with the. Oh my god, we're <laughs> going. Stop. <laughs> no nope, request denied. Um, I just got off the phone with John. Uh, when I hit recording, the the a message window popped up on his. Uh, iPad, he couldn't get it off, so he's logging back in, and then we'll uh, we'll figure this out. How are you doing, Karina? Good. Good. Good over here. Let's see here. Let's give it another minute or two. Technical difficulties. You're recording right now, you know. Yeah, so I know. In case you want to pause it. No, it's fine. I don't want to re-create a new new issue for John when he comes back on. So. Oh my god. Let's see. How are you doing, Henry? I'm all right. Not in the not in the best shape possible, but why? What happened? Uh, it's just I haven't don't have the structures in place for at work for me to be fully in my essence. Okay. Do it another minute and then I call them again. I know. I understand about structures. It's frustrating. Mm 
<laughs> it doesn't come back in by 805, we'll call him again. <laughs> All right. All right, he's coming back. John, can you hear us? Okay, uh, sorry, I'm uh, now we're here again. Let's let's just see if I can start my video. All right, there we go. Perfect, 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 perfect. All right, so we're gonna jump right into it. Um, so how was the last two weeks for you guys? I beg your pardon? I was asking the class how the last two weeks was for them. It was good. We had some great, we had some great group meetings. I think triad meetings were really intense and... Intense, how? Just so I think we, um got some really good discussion out of out of the the homework all right well speaking of homework we're going to review the assignment so if everyone could just take out the assignment list from uh may 6 11 days ago um so first part of the assignment was noticing what did you guys notice these past two weeks who'd like to share April. Well, I shared I shared this with my triad and Eric, you requested me to share this with everyone else, but I'll just kind of reiterate. I noticed that I avoid measuring myself, like measuring, you know, day to day, week to week, month to month. I have this abstract, vague, aloof, you know, kind of gist of a direction, but I don't actually, I, I avoid measuring because it allows me to be justified in being a victim and to be in analysis paralysis. Well, what, what do I, what can I do? I, I don't know. I don't know how to measure. So it's like, it's been a, it's been a painful, but profound discovery in like how I've resisted that. What's been painful about it for you? Well, I kind of like how I talked about in turning pro it's like breakthroughs are always brought about by some kind of breakdown it's not glorious it's painful to be in the truth of how i've been being and the impact it's had on me and i don't i i every bone in my body says it's just like poor baby you it's so hard and you know it's actually stepping past that is, is physically painful well good on you though for staying present with it and not kind of collapsing You know, because that's it's it's a different Abram, the one who goes into that place and then he co needs coaching and advice and all that, where it doesn't really do anything, versus actually staying present, getting the impact, and then doing something about. It. Yeah, it's, it's the it's a lesson that I've avoided learning, but I feel like the being in the depths of the despair, the bottom of the valley, so to speak, I can't count on anyone but myself you know so that it, it forces me to well it forces me to die or to actually try <laughs> yeah. that is the, that is the power of staying present in stage two really good man it's really awesome uh who else karina what did you notice the last couple weeks i noticed moments where i would shut down with adam my partner mm -hmm. when we have issues and honestly, it was like him who pointed out, like, you're shutting down right now. But, uh, big, 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 uh, big difference than 26 weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. All right. And then uh, do your daily boxes, do your daily inquiry. 
authorize yourself to be great. Uh, the fifth and sixth, I'd like to hear from a few people. So the fifth part of the assignment was write or type out where you find yourself in uh, the first stage and the second stage of relationships. Nothing to do with it. Just notice and bring this assignment to your triad call. So what did you guys notice uh, out of that? Oh, sure. Henry, Henry sorry. Henry, go ahead. I, I noticed that um, I hadn't really, like, um, I didn't have any way to categorize my, the way I was being inside of my relationships. Mm -hmm. And then after I started seeing it, oh, okay. And then, then I had a place where I could be curious and ask other people how they're like, and then that opened up more conversation for me to learn about, oh, like, oh, relationships could be this way and, and that way. And I could ask these questions to, to enable another area of the relationship. And it, and it opened up a lot for me. What did it open up for you? It opened up like an opportunity for me to like, like ask questions about how the other person was feeling in the, in the relationship that oh. I didn't know like could be a next step for the, for the relationship to advance forward. Awesome. Thank you, Henry. Take one more. Wendy, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> um, we, I, love, I love the participation today. This is great. We had a really great conversation about the path of relationships, about the stages, and about like all in, actually, because we were kind of talking about, um, I, I hope I can recapture this, but it, it's like this the level three relationships and then how does it apply or how does it relate to what the conversation that we had several weeks ago about being all in where the relationship is at mm -hmm. so the way that it occurred to me and i'm anxious to hear john's point of view on this too but to me it seems like the path of the relationships is a journey like you don't just it doesn't seem possible to me that you could just meet someone and be in a level three relationship. Although I seem, seem to remember you saying something about that you have had relationships like that. Mm -hmm. But to me, it just seems like there's always a little bit of anxiety when you first meet and you have to calm the identity down and put it to rest, you know, that it's going to be all doing what the identity does, right? But then you get into the stage you know, as you get to know each other and you kind of set a few boundaries and everything. And then as the relationship progresses and goes along that path and journey, then it can become this flowing thing. And not that it always does, but that's, that's to me, like the journey of it, yeah. not like you can start out and say, well, I'm only looking for a stage, I'm a level three relationship and you don't qualify, you know? So yeah, well, that, that, that really wouldn't, wouldn't be it. That would just be hiding behind something. Yeah. So is that, so I guess where I kind of got my brain went was about the, you know, being all in where the relationship's at mm -hmm. and being, so it seems like it could be the same thing. You can be a level three or is, is where for where the relationship's at. That doesn't mean you're like a full on, I mean, I don't know. I, the more I talk, I get, I'm confusing myself, but it was, I don't know, it was very distinct and it was a very great um, conversation that we had about the path and the stages of relationship and what your expectations are when you start a relationship or when you're first meeting someone, you know, like setting boundaries isn't wrong. It's, it's like when you're first, wrong. yeah, when you're first getting to know someone, they have to know like this, hi, nice to meet you this is you know <laughs> this is kind of who i am and this is who you are and it's like that process and that journey anyway i think you get my point yeah look those those stages of relationships are there just to distinguish something it's not like one is wrong one is right um but being able to have some language and distinction for for where you're at uh, makes something available you know raise your hand guys if you saw that it made something available to you um seeing those three stages the last two weeks yeah cool that's all that's all it is 
It also seems like in different areas of your life together, you could be at different stages. Uh, you know, absolutely. You know, like where it comes to money, you could be like, okay, 50, 50, this is yours. This is mine. You pay that you pay this. And then, but in other areas of relationship, you can be like totally given over to each other. You know how, you know, the money, money thing is a great example, right? You know, there's, if, if you were to take a poll, this is a very politically incorrect thing to say, right? But if you were to take a poll of a whole group of women, right? This is the stage one conversation that women would have is that it feels good to have a sugar daddy. That, that would be a stage one, you know, from David Data's distinctions, a, a stage one relationship. I need a guy, I need a man to provide for me. Right. And then this, there's this would be the second stage. If I'm a strong and independent woman, I don't need no guy to provide for me. I'll make my own income. Right. Healthier than relying on a sugar daddy. And then the third stage could be, right. You're successful. You're a, you know, a professional and it feels good to be taken on a date. It feels good to be treated. Not that you need it, but it actually honors something in your essence. And, and you can have more than one at the same time. I, I know plenty of women where if they're honest with themselves, they have the stage one and stage three side of them going on at the same time. So yeah, you can have, you can have multiple ones arise. All right, great. And the sixth part of the assignment was write or type out what you are noticing about your own essence when fully surrendered into it. And don't worry about societal expectations or political correctness, just the truth. Wendy? Okay. Yeah, I had a little. This is another great part of the conversation because it was like I had it that, um, like, I tend to be dominating and bossy. Mm -hmm. And I, I tend to equate that with being masculine instead of being like then i kind of step back and saw that's kind of the mothering nurturing part of me interesting right so it's kind of like wait a minute is this feminine or masculine energy when i'm kind of dominating and i'm fussing you know i'm fussing around and just like this needs to be this way this needs to be that way i'm like that's what i did as a mother so <laughs> is like is that feminine or is that masculine? And how would you? Because it's just simply dominating, submissive, submissive doesn't for me. What do you see? Um. Well, there's just many facets to both of it, you know, to to all of it. And then you know, Abram pointed out, you know, the feminine is the chaos, open, wild, and free. Um. So it's kind of like, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, it's an inquiry. It's still an inquiry, you know? You just keep looking. Anyone else? I'd take to one more person to share from uh, that part of the assignment. I'll go. So ahead, Kevin. Um, <clears throat> So what I noticed is that when I'm fully surrendered into my own essence, um, I embody much more masculine energy. Um, and what I noticed, what's funny about that is when I am not in that space, when I'm in more of a level two, being afraid of offending anybody type space, mm -hmm. um, I'm just kind of quiet and you know, don't really say anything and just try not to ruffle any feathers. Uh, and what I noticed is that when I'm more in my essence, there's a much stronger masculine energy and people trust me and are attracted to me more, not in a sexual sense, but just in general. And that I feel like I am able to balance while being more masculine forward, balance masculine and feminine, feminine energy very well, and then help, help other people step into their capital S self. 
great which is connection that you're making there. Such a impactful and incredible thing. And it just like when when I notice that and when I look at that, it makes me laugh because the default behavior is to just hide and and keep all of that from everyone else, which is worse than offending them. Did you notice that your capacity to actually ground yourself in the cultural map at stage four becomes significantly more powerful? Oh, absolutely. Can you start to see why the last five weeks we've had this conversation? Because remember, remember I said the first week, I said, some of this stuff is going to be very, very strange. And it's not going to be intuitive why we're going into this. Because this, this is not a relationship seminar or, you know, a romantic relationship seminar, right? This is, this is, we're still doing a tribal leadership. This is still a leadership program. Why are we talking about romance? Why are we talking about sexuality? Why am I showing you, you know, a David Data video on spirit, sex, and love? So starting, you, you're starting to, to make some connections here, Kevin? Absolutely. What else, what else are you seeing in relationship to the tribal leadership distinctions? Uh, I am a much stronger member of a triad mm -hmm. when I'm in this space as well, because I often will in the stage two, in the, in the other fellas stage two, uh, where I'm like afraid to offend people, I'll be afraid to generate with the triad and, and step up and, you know, bring us where we want to go more. Because I'm like, oh, well, they might be busy. You know, oh, I don't want to be overbearing, you know? Um, and so I get that. I get that now. Yeah. You know, one of the intentions of bringing some of David Data's work into this course was I had seen for the last, I don't know, 10 years now that there's, at least from my point of view, certain cultural forces that are having people become more and more disconnected to who they authentically are, you know, with certain political correctness and how they're supposed to be. And there's an impact to who, to who you're going to be as a leader in the world if you're not connected to who you really are. You know, Kevin, if you are not wanting to rock the boat and um, I could almost say, more in your feminine and not connected to your core, certainly you can see there's an impact to your leadership. And the beautiful thing about, I think, Data's work is that you no, know, regardless of how toxic the political correctness gets in the society, when you start to look from, you know, the lenses that are introduced in that talk and you discover something it kind of hits you there's a truth that hits you and you know it to be true every bone in your body knows it to be true regardless of the politically correct conversation and the more you get honest with yourself about who you actually are what you actually desire what actually brings you vitality it can be a little scary because sometimes the truth is very different to what society tells you should be the truth. You know, raise your hand if you've actually started to see there's a, sometimes a big difference between the two. And if you've noticed that. Yeah, Abram Karina, not you guys. Everything about your own truth is exactly the way that the culture tells you to be. Can you say the, the two things again? I'm, I'm just kind of processing what you said. There's what you discover to be the truth about who you are. Yeah. On one hand. And then there's the politically correct conversation of what you're supposed to be like. And they're not yeah, always the same. Now, sometimes there is overlap, right? Like thou shall not kill, probably a good virtue. <laughs> probably, you know, something to follow in society. But there's other things about what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? Things around sexuality, things around leadership. That you that start that you can get kind of confronted with, and it doesn't mean that you have to be run by every single desire that you have. 
but to acknowledge the different parts of you makes you more effective as a leader and you can just own it. You know, it would be kind of weird, for example, you know, sometimes I, you know, call out my stage threeness and being, you know, being an arrogant, you know, piece of POS. Um, but if that was in the space and I didn't say anything, all right, or I had like a false humility, it would be kind of gross. It would be fake. It would have an impact on, on my own leadership, my own effectiveness of, of leading a program. The more you can just own who you are, you know, even the parts of you that you don't want to admit are there, the less it's going to be, get in the way, the less it's going to be in the space. That's why we did that whole, um, you know, how we are known conversation a while back with, you know, stereotype and reputation and, and all that jazz. So we're going to move, we're going to move on, but um, Abram, is that clear that up for you? Yeah. Yeah, yes, I see. I get everything you're saying. Cool. Um, and then the last thing was, so we had a book to read, uh, Turning Pro by Stephen Pressfield. Uh, was there anyone who did not complete the book? Karina did not complete the book? All right, everyone else complete the book? Cool. So everyone who finish the book what did you get from what did you get from reading the book we're gonna we're gonna this is a very this is a very um you could say pressing conversation because tonight we're going to be distinguishing the world of choice and being all in from a leadership context a lot of overlap in that book john have you read that book out of curiosity uh no i, I read a lot of stephen pressfield but i haven't read that and so it, it's his sequel to um the war of art ah uh. Okay. So in the war of art, you know, he talks about the resistance and then turning pro his second book was all about the distinction of being, of choosing to be a professional. Yeah. Excellent conversation. Yeah. So Abram, what did you see out of that, uh, out of that read? It was a quick read, right? It was, it was, you know, I, 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 I did a lot of, I had an audio book. I did a lot of rewind. I had to double back a lot. I was like, I really, it's like, wow, I've been an amateur here. I've been an addict here. I've had a lot of shadow actions or shadow schedules, shadow weeks where I'm following a, you know, following a metaphor of my dream and not actually my, my commitment. And what, hold on, stop. That's a big deal. What did you see there between the, um, the metaphor of your dream versus what your actual dream is? You know, it's, it, I, I would distinguish it like it's like, talking about it versus doing it it's like <laughs> the metaphor of my dream is it's like the idea it's it's like doing something that is the idea of what i say i'm committed to rather than that thing so like for example like any any, ta any task in any area of my life like the quadrants of my life like my home my my well-being and fitness my my career and finances you know i will get distracted by saying what I want to do and just kind of feeling it's like almost treated like a checklist like yep this is what I this is what I want and this is what I'm committed to and then turning the other way and and actually running down uh it's like yeah like look at me I'm 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 committed to to wonder freedom and peace and love and but I'm my actions are not conducive to that commitment so it's it's a lot of it's a shadow it's like I'll do something but I feel inauthentic because I, I, when I actually honest with myself, I'm just following this metaphor of my dream and not actually my dream. Have you started taking any new actions based on what you realized from the book? Um, I have. Well, so I, well, yes, I have. And that's partly why I sent that text to you into the triad today is like getting, first of all, I'm, well, the action is I made a commitment, a declaration to get clear on measuring the, my commitments and that so that's like the first thing because i i have it's funny because i i've always known what to do intellectually i know i know what i need to do and i i know what i i could teach a course or a class about how to do it but that has nothing to do with me actually doing it and so it's like 
So where I'm seeing is my turning pro, like actually that choice that I have, like this, that visceral experience comes from what gave me my playing, what's the goal post? How do I know if I'm winning and how do I know if I'm losing? I've up to this point, it's been like a vague kind of target in this general direction. And maybe I'll shoot in this direction rather than like, how do I know if I'm, if I'm heading in this direction and how do I know if I'm not? And so like that, so that's the first action is just committing to the measurement and we week, doing weekly honest check-ins and I suppose even gap analysis well, for that. The, the first action would actually just be declaring that you're being a professional. Did you yeah. actually go through and do that for yourself? Like that's, that was literally the pretense of the text. Yeah. You know? Like, yeah. So yeah, I, I, that is, that is my commitment to be a professional and, you know, not fall victim to my own victimhood, you know, not fall, you know, it is a journey. It is, there's lots of obstacles as come as comes with anything you're committed to nothing worthwhile comes easy but in declaring that you know i see all the fog of what's been there before but it's staying grounded and i think that's the key word is balanced and grounded knowing i don't need to do everything being patient with myself being compassionate with myself but also holding myself disciplined and, and accountable for what i'm what i'm actually defining is what i'm committed to rather than this idea of what i'm committed to Hmm, really good. Shay, what about you? What did you uh, see from the book for yourself? Well, so I actually had a question. Um, when I was reading it, do you remember in chapter 20 when they're talking, I think it was like they're talking about Dave and picking apples and stuff. No, oh, they have a thing where they're talking about like pulling the pin. And so he's like, oh, like I stayed and then his coworker Dave stayed and like how he picks apples and how before like he's such a hard worker right and then before he um that life of hard working he like actually lived in the city and works like a job and had a girlfriend in an apartment but then he pulled the pin on that and came back to apple picking and are they saying that is turning pro like just like that part of working hard or like what part of that is turning pro I guess I don't get I don't remember the specific context okay can I I can yeah, go ahead. So pulling the pin is an extremely amateur thing to do is the point that the book was making. Basically just giving up. Just like, yeah, that's it. I give up. And so what they're saying is pro is the opposite. They talked about the fella that uh, picked like five to six bushels of apples a day. Yeah. Everyone else was happy if they got two. Like that guy was a pro. He never pulled the pin. He never quit. Okay. And Shay, the, the more, you know, this ties into the resistance conversation is the more you follow what you're actually, you know, what your life's actually about, not the, this, you know, shadow metaphor of what, you know, your life could be mm -hmm. sharing, the more resistance will come up for you. You know, for example, just this morning, Right. And you, you just want to see how ridiculous this is, but it's a very visceral experience. Just this morning, I woke up and someone was supposed to get back to me around something. They didn't. And it had to do with, you know, tribal leadership. And then, you know, my mind goes to, this is just the resistance or you could say what you call your shark goes to, you know, F tribal leadership. Once I'm done with a seminar, I'm quitting, I'm retiring, I'm never leading another program again. You know, I'm just going to focus full time on investing. And these are a waste of time. And I put in all this energy and work for what? For nothing. Uh, and I had this whole diatribe in my head of how BS all this crap is. And I'm, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm never going to do this again. Because of one stupid little thing that, that took 10 seconds to work out when I actually called the person. Interesting. So that's, a, and it's a visceral experience. Like it's, it's a, it, my chest gets tight. My, my, my eyebrows kind of go like that. And I get kind of angry. Like I want to punch a wall or something like that. I, this is a real experience for me. And this comes up for me in my work on a weekly basis. Sometimes every day, certainly every week where I want to quit something, where I want to stop something. So, you know, I've been running my investment firm since 2014. 
and I wanted to quit almost once a week. Well, first month, it was fun. You know, it's all magical and you've started a new, you know, yeah, new yeah. startup, but then you realize no one's actually giving you any money. So you actually have to like go out there and ask people for money. It's not as, it's not as easy anymore. Um, and then of course, you know, those first six months where no one gives me money, oh, who's going to trust me? Why would anyone give me money? I should just probably work in an investment bank. I should just probably, you know, and I started actually reaching out to banks and, and hedge funds to think about me. I should just go get a job there. Thank God. No one, no one, no one, uh, no one took me that seriously. I wasn't trying that hard, but that's, that's, that's the resistance in action. And it's this conscious choice every single day or afternoon when I wake up <laughs> to, to actually choose to be a professional that day. And some days I do it better than others, but it's the conscious choice. And you bet, you know, like you bet your ass, like a lot of the time, I'm not actually feeling that, that what has me stay professional and continue to move, move along is that I gave my word and I made a choice to do it. Because nothing else, nothing else is keeping me going sometimes. Right. And, and, you know, I have good news and bad news for you. Which one would you like first? Mm, bad. All right. So your bad, the bad news is it only gets worse. So it's, it's not getting better. You know, it's not like, you know, one day you, you accomplish some project and then the resistance is gone and, 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 and now you're, now you're good. And now you're a professional. So it's not getting any better. And actually the bigger you play, the worse it can get. You want the good news? Yeah. Just want to stay in the bad news. No, go on. Okay. <laughs> You're so polite. The, the, the good news is you actually have that choice to stay a professional. You have that choice to be a leader. You have that choice to fulfill on your destiny. That's a moment by moment choice. I'm just thinking like, when are you like, you're like, okay, this investing thing is like, I'm like, I'm done with it. When are you gonna be like, keep going with it? Or like, okay, time to hand it off to someone else. You know, I, I have found so, you know, the thing about resistance, which I've seen is it, it, it's always going to happen when you're moving to, when you're leveling up, when you're, when you're moving to a, a greater and bigger space, not the other way. You, you're not going to have resistance. You know, if you say, I'm going to go eat a clean diet and then you see a chocolate chip cookie and you're really into chocolate chip cookies, there's not going to be any part of it that goes, oh, you know, you're, you're not, there's not going to be anything resisting the cookie. It's, it's easy to eat the cookie. The resistance comes in when you see a cookie and you go, no, just this one time. I'll just, you know, I deserve it today. Mm-hmm. That's, the, that's the resistance. And then eat, that one cookie becomes 10 cookies. And then before you know it, you've been eating one cookie or 10 cookies for 10 days straight. And you go, how did, how did I get to this point? With projects, sometimes when it's time to hand it off or you want to complete it in some way, the resistance is you actually want to, is, is a part of you will say, oh, don't be a quitter. Keep going. That's how the resistance will look. And it keeps you small. It keeps you in a lower position that at your heart, you know, it's true that you actually should, should move on, go to the next level. Just if you want to see this, go talk to someone, you know, at your local grocery store, you know, at high B or something. And someone who's been working there for 30 years and isn't a manager and they don't really seem like they're really lit up by their job, but it's comfortable for them and they don't have to think about anything. And you, and you ask them about like why they're still there. Oh, cause I've always had the job. And then they'll have all, all their justifications and rationalizations why they're there, but you can feel like, you know, the truth is they don't, you know, it's not where they're meant to be, but they haven't taken the leap because that's the unknown. It, it could be scary. Go talk to an unhappily married couple. There's a lot of them. And you can see the resistance of them staying together or not working things out. You all know what I'm talking about. 
so when you know, and this is where, you know, Shay, you just need to trust your intuition, like really that deep part of your heart. You'll know when, well, I said your heart, you'll, you'll know when it's time to move on. It's the resistance that will stop you from doing it. Part of choosing to be a professional is that if it's time to move on, you move on and you don't look back. And, you know, someone like you, who actually has a lot to share and a lot to give, you know, I don't think you're going to be a babysitter the rest of your life. Yeah. You're not. If in 20 years, you're still a babysitter, that's just resistance. At the expense of destroying all your dreams in the process. And that would be really sad. Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, it's funny though, because in the triad call with like the stage one, two, three, like needing someone or whatever, yeah. I found out I need someone for literally any decision I make. So mm. there's so much resistance about like moving forward because if there's the decision there, then I'm like, well, I got to talk to 50 people about what they think, you know, mm -hmm. about it. Instead yeah, of, like, you know, there's, there's two ways this shows up. So there's the, I need to talk to a lot of people about some decision which in my heart, I already know the truth. See, if you're honest with yourself, you already know what there is to do. It's just easier to talk to 50 people about it because it keeps you not actually making a decision. You see that? Yeah. Or like I'll, until someone says the one that I want. I yeah, guess, exactly. yeah. 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 So. <laughs> so, you know, people when they ask for advice, you're just kind of off, often looking for the thing they would do anyway. They just want to hear it from someone. Yeah. I That's why I don't give advice to people. <laughs> this, this, the second thing, though, is another way this shows up, which is very common, is it's in the, it's in the, um, the asking for advice. Or, you know, in the coaching world, asking for coaching. And if you look, there's people who are addicted, and it might be some of you, addicted to asking for coaching or asking for advice which is very distinct from needing support. Sometimes you need support, right? There are people who refuse to get support, that's, but it's two sides of the same coin. Refusing to get support to not make a choice is just as bullshit as asking 50 people for support or asking for coaching when you already know what there is to do. So it shows up in different ways, but it's all, it's all resistance and it's all part of the amateur conversation. And then you don't have to be responsible for anything. Wait, what? What am I not responsible for? The choice you make. See, when you stay, when you stay in the amateur conversation, you kind of stay in the unknown. I don't know what I'm going to do. You yeah. don't have to actually be responsible for the impact of any of your decisions. Oh, cool. Because there's no decision then. Yeah, there's no, still no. There's a, no, there's a decision. The decision is no decision. That's still a decision. That's still a commitment. Yeah. It's just a commitment to not actually being all in with anything. Still a commitment, right? There are people who are committed not being all in. While pretending they want to be all in. So I think on that note, that might be a very good segue um, to tonight's conversation. Shay, I'd like you to read the intention for tonight. It's in the chat box. All right, let me see. Perfect. Okay, intention. To distinguish the world of choice and being all in from a leadership concept. Yes. And see, delving into this world of choice, okay, and looking at it from a leadership context, it's going to actually take having to be responsible for something. One thing that might show up in this conversation is what you haven't been responsible for. And there's a real impact to that. It, this is a very, say a very grown up adult, mature conversation around leadership. And we're gonna be raising the stakes tonight by revisiting this distinction of being all in. 
you guys remember we had an all-in conversation in the first week of this program. You guys all remember that? So we're just raising the stakes and going to look at this newly, like, you know, like the first time we're having this conversation tonight. See, Shay, you're going to Nashville pretty soon, right? For that retreat? Yeah. Yeah. Now, you remember two weeks ago, I had asked you a question in front of the group. And I said, what was it like for you when you were talking about it, talking about it, talking about it, and then you eventually bought the ticket? And you said, I haven't bought the ticket yet. Mm -hmm. And then there was all the stuff that you had to work around and the circumstances. Of... Now, what was the experience of yourself when you actually made the request you needed to make and you actually purchased the ticket and made it all work? What was that like for you when you actually just took that on and took full responsibility for making it work, regardless of the circumstances? Um, I wouldn't say I was like, I'm very much like go through the process. Then when I get there, I'm going to be, it's like, then I'll be excited. Cause like, even when I was moved, like moved to a different apartment, I just got through the moving. And then I was like, Oh, my new apartment. So mm -hmm. I think I like bought the ticket, get on the plane, get there. And then I'm going to be like, Oh my God, I'm at the retreat. So get back to you next week. I think. <laughs> I, no, I want you, I want you, I really don't want to step over this though. I want you to look at this. I just, I don't know. I don't feel like any, like, I'm still like, until it happens, it hasn't kind of. Just, just work with me. And if there's nothing you see, that's okay. I just want you to try this on. Okay. You willing to do that? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> when you have not purchased the ticket yet, and there was all these circumstantial concerns, mm -hmm. how does that, how did that feel? What was that like for you? kind of being in that and kind of being a little, you know, overwhelmed. I mean, it was kind of like the maze of just, I mean, not that hard, but I just like figuring out like the scheduling of like telling these people, oh, I can't come to these things. And then, you know, working with the family that I have now and cause they are going on some trips and I had mine and just kind of coordinating the dates to whatever. And then. But you had some, you had some, wasn't that you had some you had some real concerns well what if they don't want to do that what are they going to think remember all that I was flaky yeah that I would like started this job and I'm already ditching yeah so how did that feel what was that experience like for you when you had all that stuff that you weren't actually dealing with um like now before what was that like I mean like how I was feeling I was kind of like nervous about like to even have the conversation about going mm -hmm. with like the family and stuff and then when you were actually able to have those conversations yeah right and you go from this kind of state of nervousness I don't know with, you know there's there's sort of a there's a smallness there yeah, definitely. And when you actually took the action to have the conversations and you said, okay, you know what? I'm going to confront this maze and navigate it. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. It's the unknown, but I'm going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. There's a state shift there. What, what, did that, what was that actual experience for yourself navigating the maze? I mean, like, I felt like more open, I guess, like with like the conversation, just like being able to say like, this is how things are happening not like in a mean way but like just kind of like like this is what I have going on and stuff yeah and it got less scary didn't it yeah <laughs> and the more you went through the maze the easier it became right well yeah buying the ticket I mean that was like somewhat hard but mainly I was just you know that was later so yeah. see as you continue to navigate the maze and you're destroying that resistance and doing what there is to do, you start to see what there is to do, but you can't ever know that until you start to do it. Right. Part of being a professional in life is living from that space. It is the unknown. It is a maze. Life is not black and white. It's not like you press the button and this is the output. <laughs> there are nuances 
And there's actually feeling from that deepest part of your core of what's the next space, what's the next thing to do. And then sometimes you don't get the result and you course correct. And the people who really make it in life are the people who can actually stay with it and keep course correcting, even if it's you know, 50, 100 times till they get the result. Most people give up after once or twice. Oh, I guess I couldn't do it. Nope, oh, we're done. Nope, oh, okay, that's it. And when you look at people who've you know, had a lot of success, what you don't see is all the micro failures along the way. All the correctable results along the way. And the only difference between that professional and the amateur is the professional keeps course correcting. The amateur goes, oh, I guess I failed. And that's it. So you just want to stay with that conversation, Chad. So I'm going to pass it off to John. Johnny, you've been so graciously uh, just kind of being here and and uh, just being here. Um, would love for you to take it away and delve a bit deeper into um, this all in conversation and, you know, really looking at participation and success uh, from a leadership context. So with that, uh, John, the floor is yours, my friend. Well, thank you uh, very much. Um... It's been fascinating to sit here uh, with you because, you know, we all met, I don't know what it was, a couple of months or so ago, and uh, you're not the same people. <laughs> I know you, you know, in one sense you are, but uh, uh, it's really uh, great to see your growth, all of you, including you, Eric. Thank uh, you. So I'm going to kind of riff a little bit. I will get to all in for sure, I promise you, but uh, I want to kind of riff around on this a little bit. I'm, I'm toying with an idea or toying with a practice. Let me put it that way. And I'm more than toying with it. I'm practicing a practice that I'm calling uh, jazz leadership, uh, which is if you think about jazz, uh, you think about uh, when you have a jazz combo, the first thing is you got to really listen to each other. That's what the triad is about is you got to really listen to each other. And then uh, the, uh, then people play something behind, like a vamp, behind the soloist. And the horn player steps up, maybe you've established a melody or something like that. Then the horn player steps up and they play a riff. They play a variation on, it's in the same key, and it's in probably the same tempo and so on like that, but they're playing a riff on it. And then they go back in and they start vamping and the keyboard player. Uh, then plays their solo. So in jazz, it's a stage four kind of ensemble where you are working with people that you respect and honor, that everybody has an opportunity to actually be the leader or to be out front and play their solo riffs and, and do their creative and imaginative things. And, uh, and then step back in and support everybody else. So uh, I just wanted to share that with you that as you go to stage four, you're gonna be, you're gonna be going from doing, uh, shall we say, music the way you got taught in high school and you know, life to where you're going to actually be able to riff. You're gonna be able to actually build a composition and you're going to build your groups around you, those stage four groups, so that you're playing and you're playing in a way that, that actually has everybody look good uh, eventually. So there's, there's things like that. You know, when you ask, what's the point of uh, leadership? Really, what's the point of leadership? And I'm liking the way you're inquiring, but I'm gonna kind of jump to the chase here because I wanna make a point. The point is freedom. The point is freedom for you and the point is freedom for the people that you're leading. And, you know, given the free leadership is uh, uh, elective, people are voting all the time, uh, as opposed to authoritative, you have no vote, you got to do what I say, 
kind of a tyrannic, tyrannical kind of sort of thing. Uh, in the case that you get it, uh, you say, well, you know, like Eric waking up this morning and going, eh, I'm done, uh, you know, and inside of the context of this conversation about professionalism, which I'll go to, the point is you're doing this and there's a couple of things that are kind of on opposite sides of the ledger for you. One of them is freedom and on the other side is discipline. So you're in a freedom discipline spectrum as a leader. And the deeper you take the free, the, the discipline, this is kind of the, the kind of the weird part of it is the deeper that you actually get into and structure and uh, kind of paint yourself into a corner in terms of discipline, the more freedom you're able to access. And when you access freedom, freedom is the access to power. So what you're interested in is if you're going straight for the power, you're not gonna get there, you will crumble. But if you go for the discipline, you will actually access the freedom. The, per the purpose and the point of leadership is freedom. And that is going to give you an access to power, which is basically influence. So that's just the point I wanted to make here on there. Um, you're in a lifelong conversation and it's a deliberately difficult conversation that you've taken on. This is not a conversation, frankly, that is taken on by upwards of 90% of the population. You know, when, the, uh, when AAA uh, did a survey of drivers, what they saw was that uh, about 80% of the drivers considered themselves better than average. Now you wanna think of the insanity of that. It's not possible for 80% to be, be in the top 50%. And as a matter of fact, you drive probably every day and you're probably in a situation where you're going, huh, I'm not driving with the 80% that are great drivers, I'm driving with people that are actually inferior like that, but you keep on driving. So the, what we're talking about here is you have deliberately put yourself into a conversation that 80% or so of people never want to do. This is really where you get to the uh, uh, kind of the, the difference between uh, amateur and pro. Uh, Amateurs have a, an incredible way, you know, being pro does not mean you're the best. And there are amateurs that are better than pros, but here's the deal. There's a consistency in being a professional. Uh, cause, because uh, professionals show up and they do the process. The thing with an amateur is they're events driven. I won this thing. I did well this time. I was great in this moment. And then they give themselves, because I did that, I actually get to take a break and I get to cool it until maybe the next time that I have, I'm pulled or called or something like that to raise up and actually deliver something that is in the area of greatness. See, the point of uh, this is, again, leaders put themselves on the hook for greatness. And they know that greatness does not take a break. So they are process driven and inside of the process of creating a consistent standard of how they, how they behave, how they engage, how they do what they do, there are events that actually show up. So no matter how you cut it in your life, you're going to have events. The question is, are you going to uh, add in a consistent process? And that's what this conversation is about, is creating a consistent process at a level 
that is a demand for your greatness and the greatness of the people around you. So that conversation about all in goes this way. And I know you've heard this, but uh, uh, listen to it again as though maybe you haven't heard it. There are actually at least three ways, maybe more, but there are three ways of participating in anything you do in life, in your relationships, in your classes, in your uh, work, uh, in your uh, spiritual practices and so on. There's, and uh, it's quite often that people will uh, participate in one place like school in one way and in their spiritual practices in another way. But a pro is going to be across the board participating the same way. That's one of the things, because one of the things about a professional is consistency. And when I first started dancing professionally many years ago, uh, I had already won a number of national championships in ballroom dancing, and I had already been acknowledged as one of the better dancers in the country, probably, I'll just say it that way. Uh, and I got a job, so I, I, I so I, the first job I got was with Carol Burnett and I could actually, it was an event. Once a week, I could like really gun it up, you know, and do the thing. But on the summer vacation, I got a job with a, uh, a touring act with a woman named Julia Prouse, who is a extremely famous dancer. <clears throat> and she put the best of the best around her. And so there I was in this place where I was with the best of the best. And one thing that I realized, we were doing two shows a night, seven days a week. So we would do a month at a time and then we'd go somewhere else and we'd do two shows a night, seven days a week. You do the eight o'clock show and then you do the midnight show. And one of the things that I realized almost immediately was I was an amateur. As good as I was, I was an amateur. And what I had to do was raise the level of my performance two shows a night seven days a week and believe me you get tired of doing that and not only that as a dancer you get injured and you still got to go out there and do it but that was the first place that i ran into and had professional in my face as in you aren't one and you're going to need to actually re uh if you want to do something in this world if you want to actually be significant in this big, the world of, of uh, being a, a, a dancer in television or nightclubs or acts or shows or Broadway shows or anything else like that. You better get your consistency together and that is the beginning of where professional begins. So uh, that was hard for me. That was something I was scared to death because I knew that I, you know, Juliet had a phrase and she would come by me on stage and she would go, suck it up. And that was the key phrase. That was the magic phrase. That was the coaching, by the way, by the book, by the person who signed my paycheck, suck wow. it up. So she believed in me and she was with me on this, but unless I did the work to put myself into the process of consistent professional, uh, professional performance. And if I was just gonna do every once in a while, I was gonna do a highlight and I was gonna do something great. And I was gonna be uh, maybe even spectacular, but the rest of the time I was gonna do cruise control. She wasn't interested in that. And it was not, um, it wasn't at the level that was demanded by her particular act. So uh, consistency is one of the things. I wanna say something to you, Wendy, about you You had this comment, and it was a good comment, but the comment about, mm, I don't know if I can actually form a relationship with somebody right away. You know, we've got rules and we got boundaries and we got this and we got that. But I wanna say to you that every one of you has actually had the experience of creating a magical, all in kind of relationship, if only for a few minutes. And one of the places you've done it is when you met somebody that you maybe didn't know before and you started having a conversation with them 
And in the conversation after about 20 minutes, they were like your oldest best friend. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, now here's the deal. That happens as a remarkable kind of maybe once or twice in a lifetime experience for most people because they're not living an all in life, okay? But leaders do that six or seven times a day. That's something that they cause and here's how they cause it. You know, when you have the conversation about stereotype, reputation, and then core values, and you got that, people don't listen to you unless you actually deliver value in their world. When you met that person, you did an unusual thing and humans have been doing this for thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, you know, I guess was since language came up. And what they've been doing is they, they, we play a kind of a game of values poker with each other. When somebody says something that is a value to us in our world, we return the favor by giving them our view of values. And you get into a game of values ping pong. So I say to you, Wendy, something that kind of lights you up and you say, oh yeah, 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 that reminds me of it. You say this, 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 and I go, oh wow, that's awesome. And then I come back with you with it. And I, we keep the, the values, we keep the value in play. And if you have uh, an experience of where you play values ping pong with people and you keep it in play and you go, one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven, eight, something like that. What you've done is you've created uh, an environment between the two of you that is, by the way, the only way you can do that is be all in. You can't do it if you're being kind of cynical or uh, you know, being an ordinary person, but you actually have an interest in providing something for the person. And when you do that, you actually end up in an experience of a relationship that is all in, if only for just a few minutes, and then you go away. So you want to know that you already have expertise in being all in and creating deep and profound relationship. It's just uh, you want to build the muscle so that you can do it for more than a few minutes, or you can maintain that space for more than a few minutes. And if you're really, really committed to this, and you're in the kind of relationship that is a committed relationship, you're going to do it till the end of that relationship. So you have total control over uh, the, the power and the effect of this. Why? Because first of all, relationships are on three levels. The first level is a level called pleasure. So, you know, you like to bowl, I like to bowl, we like to bowl, let's go bowling. And when you get finished with that, okay, I'm done with bowling, I'm now gonna take up billiards. And so we're no longer friends. That's because it was a based on pleasure relationship. The one that we're generally in relationship with, and Wendy, you kind of pointed to this, uh, is we're generally in what's called a utilitarian relationship. It's a what's in it for me kind of relationship. It's a kind of a, uh, I'll, I'll give a little and see if you're gonna give. And then if you give, I'll give you a little bit more and so on like that. It's a, very, it's a very kind of hoarding and begrudging kind of relationship that most people are doing with most people all the time. And, then, and these are the people, by the way, these are the people that say that the biggest issue in their life is trust. So you can see how those go together. When you withhold, uh, you're on the verge of something and the other person that's left with, a with, a, with an interpretation of the way you're being is, I know it's coming, I'm not sure when, I'm not sure how, but I'm going to be betrayed. So betrayal is the hallmark of stage two. People who are stuck at stage two are people who are betrayed or they are betrayed about to happen. And it's all a story. So there are, so the first is pleasure, not a lot on it. Uh, then the second is utilitarian. This is where people form their business relationships and that's why there's so much uh, rancor and so much 
uh, problems happening between people in terms of partnerships, what so-called partnerships in the world because they're utilitarian partnerships. And then there's the highest level of your uh, relationship tree, which is character. Character. Character is a function of virtue. Virtue is a practice of excellence. So the practice of excellence is called a virtue, is virtue. That's a virtuous practice. And virtue forms character and character unfolds destiny. Now, most people don't know this, but leaders do. So they're constantly working on the virtuous building of their own character in order to actually have some control over the destiny that they're living into. So there's the there's a key right there. So in the area in the in the all in conversation, it was well there were three levels of that. The first level is the level called audit and cherry pick. Yeah, this is how most of uh, most everybody got through school. You know, school is too easy for one thing, and uh, people show up and they kind of generally know it or have a sense of it, or they can pick it up. May not even have to crack a book. I didn't crack a book all the way through high school. So you, you know, there's no real study about it, but it's, I'm auditing and auditing and cherry picking. It's possible, it's a completely valid way of being. It's very possible to do a course like this course in the audit and cherry pick mode. And you may have found yourself doing it that way, you know, every once in a while, it's like, okay, I'm just gonna kind of go on cruise control and then, oh, that's good, I'll take that. Or I'll write that down or whatever the deal is. But audit and cherry pick, that's the third level, totally valid, totally valid. Second level, it's a higher level, is one called scramble and whine. Now, uh, you know, when you've been around people and, and uh, you want them to do something, you'd like to enroll them in doing something, have them volunteer with you or support you on something, and they'd like to, but you don't understand. I've got so much on my plate, and they whine about it. So that's the scramble and whine level. So the people who want to look good and give it that the only thing that human beings are up to are looking good and being right. So the people who want to look good and be right scramble and whine. The people who are too cool for school audit and cherry pick. But this is a, uh, so that's a completely valid way of being. And then you'll notice that I've actually now taken about 80 or 90% of the people off the board by just saying uh, either don't participate, uh, audit and cherry pick or scramble and whine. We're now down to a, a small and I would say an elite group of people who the way they participate is they participate all in. And it doesn't take much explanation because they actually work it out for themselves. They work out the all in-ness of their way of being. You know, I don't have time, but I'm going to get it done. I don't have a way of doing this, but I'm gonna get it done. I don't have the money or whatever the deal is, but somehow I'm going to make this thing happen. It's an all in, I am all in. And it's a declaration, I am all in. Now the deal is all three of those levels are valid. And uh, the thing to understand is that a leadership program like this has a very specific design and the design is for people who are all in. So when you are participating, the participation of being all in, right or wrong, uh, all in and learning is the actual proper place to be. This is the place to learn. And, uh, and you can, people are aware of you in a heartbeat, or let me put it another way, you're aware of the people around you in a heartbeat if they are auditing and cherry picking, or if they are scrambling and whining, or if they're all in. Now, the way that a triad works is a triad only works in the all in kind of uh, clearing, way of working. 
you know, the, the fundamental rule is that vertex is accountable for the success of the opposite leg. Do you know what I'm saying when I say that? Yes, no. You know what I'm saying when I say vertex is accountable for the success of the opposite leg. So that's one, that's one rule. There's only two rules. And uh, so in order for me to uh, be accountable for the success of other people, rather than me having a concern about whether I'm going to be successful here, I have to be all in. <clears throat> now, there's three, layer, three layers of triad, or three layers to get to triad. The first one is, three people will take as a number, but it's several people hanging around a cool idea. You know, uh, John, Eric, and Shay are uh, hanging around a cool idea called leadership. That's, uh, that is a audit and cherry pick kind of place called a trio. Then there's another level, kind of gets up to the scramble and wine sort of thing, uh, where uh, you learned this as a defense mechanism when you were in junior high, actually, everybody learned it, uh, where uh, you hang out with your uh, buddy, you got your buddy somehow, and you're either senior or junior to the buddy, by the way, you have a hierarchical relationship with that person, but you take on a third person and you're going to fix them and then they don't work out, and then you trash them or you, uh, or you scapegoat them. So where scapegoating occurs is gathering people so that you can trash another, a third person. That's, that is called a troika, like the Russian word troika. That's called a troika, a lot of literature on this, a lot of stuff. So that's at the scramble and wine troika level of relationship. And then the third level is the triad level. And the triad level, of course, is uh, uh, all, for, all for one and one for all, and all committed to some kind of idea that is greater than the three of them. So that's a trick. And so it brings you to the, 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 the operative rule, which is Vertex is accountable for the success of the opposite leg. And it brings you right into the second rule. So the second rule is no free riders. Not possible to have a triad that works. It's just not a triad. It might be a troika or it might be a trio, but it's not a triad unless you've got three all in people, all of which, all of whom are uh, committed to the success of the other two. And you also are organized uh, as one uh, towards some kind of commitment that's bigger than all of you. So that's uh, a bit of the all in conversation, but let's see if there's something else I wanted to add. You guys were so interesting in your conversations that I actually ended up taking six or seven notes. So the one is, so one of them, I just want to go back and say process driven for, uh, versus events driven, uh, that pros are process driven. And what they're doing is they're creating a consistency that, that you could call that integrity. You could call that, by the way, I like that you're talking about authenticity and you're talking about inauthenticity. And there are places where each of us are authentic and there are places where each of us are inauthentic. And uh, the real deal is, I don't know if Eric has said this, but if he has, if he has, I'm gonna say it again, uh, the real deal is being authentic about your inauthenticity. If you can face yourself, then that's something that you can take to work on. So the first one, as I said, was process versus events driven life. Uh, second is, in your relationships with people, you have the power to create it virtually instantly. And how you do it is you play values ping pong. You actually are listening for what would be a valuable contribution to that person. And you say those things and get them to be saying something back that has a value, uh, has values embedded in it. 
and you get it going and you keep the ball in the air, it is fun. And it's literally uh, the highest point. And when you do this and you do this well, not only do you end up uh, in a relationship, but you end up with an experience of freedom and an experience of power and an experience of partnership. So, uh, so values ping pong. Uh, the third one is the point that I was making is that when you're into leadership, this is not like a gig and then you're going to do it for 40 years and retire and you're going to get a gold watch because you're not. But this is a lifelong growth and development program that you have designed for yourself or you have designed yourself into. There's a lot of people who teach leadership uh, or at least scramble and whine that they're teaching leadership. Uh, and there's a, most people who are in the leadership program are kind of on the upper, upper level of people who don't do much, but they do what they know how to do, which is audit and cherry pick. But as you see uh, that the demand is for all in, and I might want to add the words lean in, so all in and lean in, uh, then you're in a kind of a leadership program that is going to be valuable and that the point of it is going to be about freedom and power. And it's always going to be organized around discipline. I'm working with a couple of my students right now who are also concurrently uh, taking uh, leadership development programs uh, from the US Navy SEALs, kind of an all in proposition. And like, no kidding. And it is absolutely driving these people to a place where they had no idea that they had that capability. So all in. So let's see. The thing that you could say it is, this is a program that is all in by design. So when you come to the program, it's not only like recommended, but you're either going to be in one of the two other places, scrambling and whining or auditing and cherry picking, or you're going to be all in and leaning in. It's gonna be obvious to everybody. It's gonna be obvious to you. And in being obvious to you, you're going to be growing and developing because you're on a lifetime growth and development pathway when you're in this. Or you can quit. You know, a lot of people uh, up around my age, actually younger than me, retire. They've been working at a gig for a long, long time. And they retire. And according to the life insurance actuaries who keep the data on this, uh, for people who've been doing a lifelong type job and then they retire, uh, they are dead in 17 months. So this is why, you know, Social Security is great as a program because they only have to pay for people for 17 months and then they're dead, like that. And the whole thing is about, these are people who retired from something and then they sit and they think, oh, it's gonna be great. I'm gonna sit on the beach and drink margaritas or I'm gonna go play golf or I'm gonna uh, take up something I've wanted to do for a while. But that's, But basically they haven't done anything that was, beyond uh, adaptive, something that caused them to assimilate. So if you take a look at the distinction between adaptation and assimilation, adaptation is when you take something in, information or anything, when you take it in, and it doesn't require any kind of a shift in your way of being in order for you to uh, make it useful for, to you. So like if you drink a glass of water, for example, that's adaptation, your organs are all set up, they're waiting for it, you drink the water, nothing changes. But there's assimilation. And assimilation is when you take something in and it literally is a demand that you change inside, that you alter inside. Spiritual conversations are like this. Leadership is an assimilative kind of conversation. And what the reason it is is because you want to take it in, you want to assimilate it, and then you want to integrate it into your system, and then you want to be in action. This is a whole lot of why Eric is asking you, well, what did you get out of the book? He wants to know what, he doesn't want to know 
uh, anything that you saw to adapt to. He saw, he saw, he's looking for what did you see that you could assimilate, integrate, and put into practice? And uh, uh, really, yeah, you know, just Pressfield is a, is a great, he's, he's a great writer. He's, he's, he's notable all over the world and he's got a great story. I don't know if you know his story, but uh, if you look up and you see the story, you would be, uh, you'd be inspired by it. So um, all in by design. Uh, and you might want to say, because it gets down to virtue forms, character, character unfolds destiny, is it all in is virtuous action. Being all in, taking yourself to that point that you are being all in is virtuous action and that forms a deeper, more profound, richer leadership character. And the character is what's going to unfold your destiny. And of course, as you share it, unfold the destiny of the people that you influence. So I think I, uh, I got all my points here. So that's what I have to say. Thank you, John. And you guys will notice too, if you look at those moments where you experience really being a leader, you really experience being a professional. The discipline conversation you'll notice is there. It's kind of like, kind of like a drug addict. If you look at someone who's a drug addict, and I don't necessarily mean someone who's shooting up heroin every day. Say you have a sugar addiction right? You just pound down fast food every day. It kind of looks like this. You're driving down the highway. You may be hungry. You may not be hungry. Raise your hand. Have you ever, have you ever eaten when you weren't actually hungry? You had that experience, right? Henry, never have. Only person who hasn't. Okay. So you're, you know, you're driving down the highway and you see those golden yellow arches. You go, oh, McDonald's. And it triggers all of the stuff that you associate with McDonald's, all the pleasure, all the little dopamine hits start, start going. You pull in and in your head, you go, I know I shouldn't be doing this. No, this is not good for me. I'll just this one time. Okay, well, I'll do it this time, but I, you know, I shouldn't be doing this. I know I told myself I'm gonna eat clean and really be on a diet and really eat healthy, but just some fries are not gonna really hurt me that much. And just a Coke and maybe a burger. And, and, and you do it. And you're, you're, you're sitting in the parking lot and you're really enjoying it. it. Feels really good. But if you also look, there's a part of you that kind of feels like shit. Because you know, you just succumb to like whatever whim and you saw them. You're not even hungry and you know you're not hungry. And there's even that thought, am I even hungry? Why am I doing this? And you're, why am I eating this right now? And you're, and you're eating and it feels good. And then you're at war with yourself and you go, oh, sure, I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm doing it. Okay, well, I won't do it again. Next time I won't do it. Who's had that conversation before? Yeah. That's the amateur conversation. Well, you know, that's a, here's, a, here's the deal. Leaders put together, put themselves into conversations where they put themselves on the hook for greatness. And so if you are that, that's your interest. And I know that's your interest, but if that is your interest and you are actually uh, intending to do it, you are on the hook. You're not on the hook to me. You're not on the hook to Eric. You're not on the hook to anyone, but Henry's on the hook to Henry. You are, uh, you are on the hook to your relationship to your own word, which is ultimately when we take everything away, the only thing you have left is your word. And you're on the hook and you're on the hook for something very specific, greatness. So you're not on the hook for ordinary. And here's the difference. Most people don't put, them on the, uh, put themselves on the hook for greatness. Most people, actually settle for something ordinary or maybe even high ordinary. 
But greatness is what leadership is about. It's not about high ordinary. And it's way not about ordinary. And so you put yourself on the hook for greatness. And because you do that, you put the people around you on the hook for greatness. And your practice for that is your triad, where you're putting your partners in the triad on the hook for their own greatness. And see, that's how you do it. Exactly. How you do it. Being on the hook for greatness. See, it is how you do it. And it sounds wonderful, right? I mean, it sounds like a wonderful, great thing. But as John said, this conversation is not for most people. In fact, it's probably not for 90% of people. But I'll tell you something. Those 90% of people not doing it, they thought about it. They might even talk about it sometimes or talk about it themselves sometimes. See, if it didn't require that you had to be on the hook, and it didn't require a certain level of responsibility, everyone would do it because it's wonderful. I mean, you guys don't, don't, don't believe a word I'm saying. Just take a look. When you've actually taken action from that space and you produce the results that you produce and you're honoring the process and honoring the things you know you're supposed to do, it's kind of awesome. Life gets better. Life gets richer. So it seems like everyone should want to do it. But that's the kicker. You have to be responsible for something. You have to be on the hook for something. And as John said, you're also on the hook for the impact of other people. See, if I give my word and I'm giving my word in the context of triad or in the context of a community of many triads, and then I don't deliver, there's an impact and I need to be responsible for cleaning it up. The, the, the thought of that you're on the hook for something bigger than yourself can be a terrifying, overwhelming experience. And it's a lot easier to stay in your little cocoon, do, you know, not, 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 you know, you know, push the edges too much. And yeah, you might have your complaints and, oh, I wish I'm going to be doing this and one day I'll do that. But the truth is you don't have to be responsible for anything. You can, you, you know, can one stay of the that, Yeah, one of the things that uh, you end up kind of reconstituting the language that you use. For example, we, there's a word that is floating around in the culture, and it's been floating around for quite a few years, so everybody knows, and they know that they know, and they know that they know that they know what it means, and the word is empowerment. And I say nobody knows what empowerment means. So I want to give you a kind of a design of it. The, the fact that uh, Eric is empowered to do whatever he does is not a function of John, even though I was his teacher. It's a function. Very good of, one, by the way. But. Yeah, but it's a but it's but it's a function of Jerome, who was my teacher. Jerome trained me, and I trained Eric, and Eric was empowered. That's Jerome's empowerment. Do you, so, guys, do you guys get that? It's, I, I, I really it, want this it, to be it, more than just a platitude, like, oh, that sounds really nice. Do you no. guys actually get that? Yeah. So, so for example, uh, you people, people whine and complain. This is Scramble and Whine. Whine and complain that in their relationship with you, the way you talk to them, the way you're being with them and everything, they're not empowered. Well, that's a bullshit kind of conversation for sure. And the fact of the matter is, what you are is you're there and you're relating to them directly. You're on a one-on-one -on -one and the best you can be is all in. And the smartest you can be is all in and play values ping pong with them. That's just flat out uh, the, the, the best and the smartest that you can do is be with people and when you're with them, be all in, lean in and play values ping pong. That's just kind of like that short version of how do you do this. But I'm not here uh, for you. I may have said this to you before, but I'm not here for you. I'm here for the dreams and the, uh, and the vision of your parents and your grandparents. And I'm here for the legacy that you're gonna be leaving your children and grandchildren. I'm interested in empowering your children and grandchildren through you. You're the one I get to talk to. You're the one Eric gets to talk to. But we're really 
Uh, this whole conversation isn't about you at all. This whole conversation is about your children and grandchildren and about fulfilling on the dreams and the aspirations of your parents and your grandparents. And that's a different way of looking at something like leadership, but it's very, very accurate. And if you take that on, then when you talk to people, you, you find out that you're talking to that valuable, precious person in front of you and you're playing values ping pong because who you're after is their kids, their grandchildren. You're after his parents. You're after empowerment. So if you take a look at and you get to a place where you're with them and you're on the same page and you have that little momentary sense of freedom. Why? Because they're going to go share. And when they go and share, when, when Eric goes and shares something that I've said to him with Wendy, he is on behalf of me. He's training her and empowering her on behalf of me. And power is measurable. My nine-year-old granddaughter came to me and she, she wasn't at school. And I said, uh, Juliet, uh, why aren't you in school? And she said, it's Martin Luther King's birthday. And I said, really? She was nine years old. She was in fourth grade. I said, tell me about Martin Luther King. And she started talking about Martin Luther King and what his life is about. And he had a dream and this and that. And within about three or four minutes, I was crying. I was weeping because I knew that not only was Juliet taken care of by her teacher, but her children and her grandchildren were taken care of because she was so organized around the right idea. Martin Luther King died in 1968 and it's been hundreds of thousands of generations away from him. And yet he empowered my granddaughter. So this is what's possible in leadership which is uh, an empowerment by design. And it's also all in by design. And it's also difficult by design because it's a discipline. But you wanna consider maybe that there's a Martin Luther King in you, that there's a Gandhi in you. And that is actually what is driving the, your gift uh, to the world. So I want to take um, 10 minutes right now and go into breakout rooms. And I want you to speculate, what's the gift you have to offer to the world? What's that part of you, that capital S self, highest self conversation, or when you share that, you become bigger, the people around you become bigger. It's your, it's your truth to share. It's your gift to share to the world. So we're gonna, and uh, John, I'm gonna include you in the breakout rooms if, if I may. Sure. Okay. One second. All right. All right. Ten minutes. And uh, see you back in ten.
Hey. So we're going to take a few people uh, of just some sharing before we uh, wrap it up for tonight and go over the assignments. So uh, who would like to share what they saw out of the breakout room? Abram. Uh, we had a really good quick chat. Uh, Wendy, Kevin, and I were uh, just kind of unpacking um, one thing Ke Kevin shared, you know, is that he, he gives people clarity and we were just kind of diving deeper. Like, well, what's like, what's on the other side of like, what, do, when you give people clarity, what are you giving them? And then like the word came up was like power. And I just like saw Kevin, he, Kevin like lit, lit up about like that. He, like, this is something like before he even said any of these things, I could hear and see that about Kevin. Cause whenever there's a triad call in the past in this space, the wind can be blowing a million directions. I could be talking about something. Someone else will be talking about something and he'll be grounded. He'll, he'll bring it back to clarity. But I, but we're unpacking that, but beneath that clarity is the power to choose the, and I just thought that was beautiful. And I just like, it, it was like, it, it, we played values ping pong. <laughs> yeah. You'll notice that when you start to touch upon what your life's about, there's, as you said brilliantly, Abram, there's a groundedness and you're also lit up. You basically become a Christmas tree. Grounded and lit up. You can't fake that. It'll just sort of, you know, spew out of your pores. And the more you follow it, the more you connect to it, the brighter and brighter it becomes there's to infinity. There's no end to that journey. And you want to know that the thing that will kill you faster than anything is your own cynicism. Yeah. You're going to allow and participate and cater to your, and honor your own cynicism. You're going to actually kill your greatness. Yeah. Well, one thing I just got from what both of you just said is that is, this is the cause and effect of, uh, what was it it's like this is the cause and effect of being all in like it's like a site it's like a circle like when we can be all it's like you can't see it like it's like the, like like stage four i can't see stage four if i'm not in the inquiry of my virtues and i see the just why how this is practice is developed how this is designed is you can't see it unless you're all in but you also get back when you're all in, you receive it. It comes back to you in the freedom, in the fulfillment. Yeah. And that's brilliant, Abram. This really is how this works. Yeah. You know, as, as, as I say, you have to step into it to see it. I, I keep, I know I say, I've said that quite a, quite a bit. If you're sitting around thinking about it, Oh, I wonder what my purpose is. I wonder what my noble cause is. I wonder, you're never going to see it. You step into it and things start to unfold. Yeah, well, you, you know, that's what all in is about because you put yourself into a clearing where it uses you instead of you trying to use it. That's yeah, where surrender comes in because you've actually got to give up the control in the situation. And it, it's, it's, it is a conversation around surrender. You know, as John likes to say, and I also like to say it, right? Leadership is a deductive conversation. It's not adding more tactics and techniques. Yeah. yeah. And I'm saying that is the tactic technique motherfucker, right? For a lot of my life, I was addicted to tactics and techniques. And I'm saying that still addicted to tactics and techniques. I'm just clear that's not the access to my own leadership. Well, it's a, what it is, is it, it is, it's a, it's an anchoring in stage three. Totally. 
John, you just took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. Karina, how about you? What did you see? I saw that I felt like I overcomplicated my my what what my gift is or what, what I bring. And John helped me see like it was something he said, he said that's a good start. And and I was like, oh damn. <laughs> And then I realized, like, oh, it's a lot more fundamental. Like, it, it can be distilled to a lot. It can just be distilled, which it, we distilled it to. My gift is, uh, we said a few things, but like being committed to people's literal well being and like being a guide for people to access themselves, essentially. It's a way of being that becomes a way of doing. And I think it got down to, or at least one of the, one of the iterations we got to is uh, you saw yourself as actually a portal or a doorway for people to come through. So you see that you can actually make the statement, I am a portal to well-being. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot more eloquent. Well, it's just a, that it's a lot more of be do. <laughs> mm, a lot more what? Be do. A lot more, the basic rule is be do and have. And so, uh, so you're being a portal and the doing is that you are actually empowering people in the area of well-being. Mm. What you're going to have is going to be a world of people, uh, you know, who are organized and are well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Big gift. See, Karina, when you get caught up in having to be all profound, yeah, right? John, you got a little of that taste of that? You'll notice it becomes very about the actions you're taking and how eloquent it sounds, and, and you get caught up in all that. Yeah. You know, there's no power in that. Yeah. See, when you're really connected to who you're being, there's a simplicity to it. And I will just, I'm going to say something to you, Corinne. I really want you to get this. When you can surrender to what your life's about and who you're being around it, that simplicity, that's profound. Like you don't have to talk about it. People get connected to it. See, you being a portal for, what, what was the, what did you say? Portal, portal for well-being. Yeah, being a portal, portal for well-being. I got chills when you said that. That's profound because that's who, that's who you are. That is the essence of who you are. Mm. And then all there is to do is surrender into that and see what shows up and stay committed to that process, of honoring that process. And then what shows up is what shows up. But I will assert, this is my assertion, Karina. I will assert that whatever shows up over the next 10, 20, 30 years is significantly Im more impactful richer, more fun, honors who you are, honors the people you touch in a way more profound and expansive um, outcome than you trying to be all profound and trying to produce all these outcomes. Mm. Yeah. You know, just stay grounded in that and have that be your, your North Star. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a great... Uh, kind of uh, Zen uh, story about uh, the, the monk and the, and, the, and the master of the temple. And the monk said, well, what is it to be, uh, he said, what do I do? He said, uh, and, the, and the master said, you chop wood and you carry water. That's what your life is about. You chop wood and carry water. He said, okay, what do I do when I become enlightened? He said, chop wood and carry water. different human being doing the chopping and the carrying but that's all we're doing we're doing our lives we're chopping wood and carrying water and in the meantime there's something opening up we're having realizations and then we're sharing it with people and and the sharing presumably is valuable so we can play ping pong hmm. yeah. Shay I'd love to hear from you what did you get out of the breakout room? Um, well, it's actually funny. So going into it, I was like, I have nothing to contribute, kind of. Like, I was like, I don't know where to go with this. 
Um, Cause like looking around the room, I was like, oh, Wendy does coaching. Karina does her thing. Kevin does his thing, you know? And I'm like, I don't have a thing. And then I was like, all I really do is like care about the people I'm around and like animals and like whatever I'm around. Like, I just like care a lot about that. I'm like, but that's not really a thing. And John's like, well, no, it is a thing because no one else really cares about stuff. So yeah. I guess I'm kind of like over looking I think anything that I have calling it not a thing maybe even if it is oh that's really great that's really good <laughs> you know uh, this is uh, this is uh, uh, Shay what I call surrendering into your own greatness yeah it's, you know the the area of maximum uh, the area of maximum resistance is the area where you are the greatest and if caring is that what it is you know, and somebody comes along, they acknowledge for that, and you go, oh, no, no, that thing, no, I'm not me, uh, you know, that sort of thing, and you deflect, then you're creating a lie, and you're disempowering your relationship with the other person, and, you know, and, 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 but to actually surrender into, accept and surrender into, and then, uh, uh, and then ultimately fall in love with who you are as a person who's caring. Mm -hmm. See, Shay, the reason I'll acknowledge parts of you knowing that, you know, half the time you'll deflect, why I put up with that is because I won't tolerate anything less than who I know you are to be. See, the cynicism, as John said earlier, the cynicism is what will destroy all that. It just takes you out of the game. It just takes you out of the game. Just flat out, the, the cynical thought is what takes you out of the game. It is, uh, it is disloyal to your own self, your capital S self. Yeah. And, you know, when I speak, speak to Sharon, I'm speaking to all y'all, is I only speak to all y'all from your capital S self. I'm not interested in any other stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm really not. I'm really not. You know, if you want to entertain that part, you know, I'm, I'm the wrong person for that. And this is the wrong place to be if you want to entertain that. And for some of you, that's been confronting. So, Eric, I'm, I'm going to actually uh, say goodbye. I want to thank you, all of you. I want to thank you for your listening. Best gift that anybody can give anybody else is, is their, the gift of their listening. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, I want to acknowledge you. You are uh, way operating on a different level than you were operating on when I came to you before. And you were not chopped liver before. You were... Uh, an, a, 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 an excellent group of people, entrepreneurs, leadership entrepreneurs. And uh, I like that you're actually taking on the discipline and you, you're really going, you know, the leadership by design is like discipline by design. And I'm glad that you're getting that. So I'm going to, I'm going to hike, but I really do appreciate it. And uh, Eric, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Oh, my honor. All right, see ya. Now let's see if I can get out of here. You're trapped. <laughs> Lock the doors. <laughs> All right. So the assignments um, for tonight, it's going to be very brief. So, you know, daily boxes, daily inquiry, all the daily practices we do. And I want you with your um, triads this week to just stay in that conversation. What is my purpose? What is my noble cause? Over the next few weeks, we're gonna spend some more time delving into the world of both values and noble cause. And not as a you know, bullshit mission statement or here's the nice thing to say, but at the level of truth and authenticity that Karina shared with you, which she shared. See Karina, if you build all your, out, all your strategies in service, to who you are as a portal for the well-being of others. Might look similar on the surface, the strategies, but who you're being and the energy that brings and, the, and how you touch people will not even be recognizable. You know, one of the reasons that, you know, John makes this work publicly available and, you know, fact that I can record these and put up clips online and you know there's the book and it's not like this is hidden information 
is part of my training working with y'all is my way of being. Anyone can read off some slides. Anyone can, you know, you could read a transcript of this conversation, say the whole goddamn thing. But if, if the beingness isn't there, if the surrender isn't there, it's not, it's not going to have the impact on people. See, it's not about, you know, some of you get so caught up in having the answer or what did this model say? All the models are made up. Tribal leadership is made up. The cultural map is made up, right? John just made it up. The power is what you get from making those distinctions. I could be reading a Greek cookbook to you and you would get tribal leadership. You guys, you guys get that? It's not the significance of what I'm saying. Sometimes it sounds very profound and sometimes it's like, what the fuck is he talking about? But somehow it gets in. Even when you're not aware of it, you look back and be like, oh shit, you have that realization about something. And why it's hard to explain if you, what was the thing that Eric said? You can't do it. You can't point to the thing that I said that produced the result because it wasn't some magical special thing I said. And if you repeated the same goddamn thing to one of your friends, it wouldn't make a damn bit of difference. Maybe at best a nice sounding bumper sticker and at worst <laughs> some crazy shit, crazy talk, bunch of caca. So uh, we're going to end it here. And I'm just looking at the calendar. So uh, next week, there's going to be no class. Um, I'm going to be hosting uh, my annual meeting. I know some of you are going to be there for that, but you all are invited and would love for all of you to be there for any of you who can make it. Um, and it's something, you know, I do at my, I'm not going to go pitch my investment company, but it's something I do at my investment company. It's not, it's not a sales pitch. It's not, you know, trying to get money from, from people. A lot of people who come uh, just come for the celebration of the community. You know, if you have an interest in, in learning about investing, I would highly recommend it. If you wanted to give me money, I'd highly recommend it. But even if you had no interest in giving me money and had no interest in becoming a professional stock picker, but just wanted maybe a few interesting insights of how to run your business or how to look at the world in a, in a unique and different way, I can promise you'll learn something that'll be useful. So it wouldn't just be to waste your time. Uh, if any of you are interested in attending and have not RSVP'd, just text or email me privately asking for an invitation. I will send you a calendar invite. Um, are there any questions before we finish up for the night? All right, well, I just wanna acknowledge all of you for your growth and your dedication to this work and staying in it, even when sometimes you've you know, lost your way a little bit. That's just how it works. And you know, I can see the growth. I know sometimes it's hard to see the growth when you're in this every week. You know, it's like you see yourself in the mirror every week, but then someone has, who hasn't seen you in a month or two, they go, oh, wow, you look great. And you think you look the same. It is night and day noticeable. I just want you guys to get that. So with that, I love you all. Good night. And if you need anything over the next week, um, you guys all have my Calendly link now from uh, last week's assignment. You can book a coaching call with me if you need a little extra support. But if you don't need extra support and you're addicted to extra support, notice that. <laughs> And with that, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. See ya.